Hello, good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on time. Week five, a month already since the beginning of the semester, and look how much fun we are having, right? Okay. This week we are going to talk about Il Sorpasso, an Italian film from 1962, which came out in the US with the so-so title, just a market employee of the easy life. They wanted to capitalize on the success of La Dolce Vita by Fellini, which had been a big hit on the American market by suggesting through the title they were similar. They were not similar at all. Keep in mind that this Friday you'll have to write the first film essay on Il Sorpasso, not viewing notes, a film essay, which is why today I'll be talking more about the themes of the film and the interpretations and less about camera angles or the visual style of the film. On Wednesday, I will provide more suggestions about the film essay, the format, and what to focus on for this particular film. Also, on Wednesday, I will introduce the second of four choices for the final paper, The Man in the Hat, not as complex as Inside Lewin Davis, so I will not be needing as much time. I will not be spending as much time on it. Okay, this is a new page. Uh, it's linked at the end, uh, at the bottom of the page on, with, with notes and analysis on Il Sorpasso. And I'll be posting the link to this page on more pages. It's just a page comprised of three or four sections with frames that are representatives of the contents or the patterns, the narrative patterns, and some of the visual patterns in this film, I'll use it for, to illustrate my point today and also Wednesday. The first section has to do with the story, and it starts with a question, a simple film, a simple story. Now, you have to keep in mind that the Italian industry, the Italian cinema industry, was burgeoning, was blossoming at this point, 1962. Very successful both within the national market. Keep in mind that by now, every single weekend, number one, but it could be number one, two, and three at the box office in Italy are American films. Okay? So, right now um, is... Uh, what is it? Uh, the the, the Ant-Man sequel. What's the title of that? Quantum. Quantumania, right? That's the big success now. It wasn't like that in 1962. Not only that, but Italian films were often successful, good commercial vehicles even outside of Italy. However, they did suffer from an Italian quality they tended to be scripted with a heavy hand. So the characters, especially the protagonists, were kind of predictable. They insisted on certain mannerisms which sometimes made them successful abroad, right? Because on, in, in a different market, in a foreign market, whether it be France, England, the US, it was seen as something different. Inside the Italian national market, it was more and more and more of the same film after film, filled with these characters which tended to be caricatures or became caricatures of themselves by the first 30 minutes, by the first 45 minutes. This film, doesn't suffer from this defect as much. Yes, the protagonist, Bruno, is 
heavily scripted in some ways, but it's still fairly complex, complex enough to be a good kind of character. The story itself is simple from a narrative standpoint, which doesn't surprise us because it is, after all, a road movie, and it is an excellent representative of the road movie genre, so the line, the, the, the storyline is very simple. It may seem, after you see it the first time, it may seem that even the significance, the meaning, the message associated with the story is simple. Because the simplest, more di most direct interpretation you can give to this movie after you see it once or twice is you have one character, Bruno, represented modernity, and the other and another character, Roberto, younger character, represented it, representing older values, old the older Italian society, and the easiest interpretation is. This movie represents modernity coming to take innocence away, coming to dramatically and, and in some ways violently changing older Italy. But although this interpretation is legitimate, in some ways there is more to this movie and that's what makes the movie itself interesting, that it's not as simple as it may seem. As you can see from the initial credits, at the very beginning of the film, we see a sports car, a Lancia, Aurelia, a fast car by the standards of that time, driving through the uh, peripheral areas of Rome. And as you can see, you see plenty of buildings, but no one is around, no one is at the window, windows, in fact, the apartments seem to be uh, locked. It is, in the story of the film, August 15, 1962. August 15 in Italy is called Ferragosto. It used to be a religious, primarily a big religious festivity celebrating the Virgin Mary, but by the post-war, during the post-war period, it became a secular festivity. It became the time, even in 1962, when going out on vacation was still reserved for the upper middle class and the upper class in Italy. It was the day, Ferragosto, when even those who couldn't afford to go on a vacation would leave their urban area and go somewhere go to the country, countryside, go to the beach, go to the mountains, go out. Okay, so 1962 through at least the 1990s, this is what you would have found for Ferragosto. In fact, there is an, a modern Italian film by Nanni Moretti, the film is called Caro Diario, which presents a similar kind of situation, the city of Rome at Ferragosto, empty with nothing to do, okay? And, and no opportunities to socialize either. So Bruno is the character who's driving this car and going places, unable to find a phone. He's looking for a phone, and we understand later that he's trying to call to reach out to friends because he drove from Amalfi, south of Naples, to Rome, which is a drive, uh, he, he said he did it in two and a half hours, which is a fast time. He's trying to reach out to friends to have someone to spend Ferragosto with. But again, he cannot find a single bar or a single store open to make even a phone call. He ends up at the very edge of the city of Rome. And in fact, you see on one side, the side opposite to this view, a series of apartment buildings, some apartment buildings, all modern 
in the, uh, in, in the back and farther away, but you can also see a lot of rural fields. In fact, to this day, right outside of Rome, you find not only agricultural land, but you find, for example, a forest with hundreds and hundreds of acres of trees. That's where he finds something for himself, this uh, uh, rudimentary fountain where he can at least have a drink. And this is where you have the premise develop of a connection between Bruno Cortona and a young guy by the name of Roberto Mariano. Now, among the things you have to keep in mind, because there is the theme of modernity, new versus old, and I have a section about that, keep in mind that exactly these kinds of apartment buildings were very modern in Italy at that time. 1962 is 17 years after the end of the war. And, of course, we know how uh, the Italian fascist government was responsible for taking the nation into the war, but Italy suffered incredible destruction and devastation at the end of the war. So much so that between 1945 and 1962, about a million apartments were built in Italy. A million new apartments in 17 years. Imagine that. Imagine what this did to the urban landscape. Because again, so many cities, including Rome, had suffered destruction that it was necessary to do, the, to do that. So you've seen the land, which represents the old. You see this apartment building, which represents the new in the eyes of the viewers from this time. And finally, the first, the only human who is around besides Bruno, the only person apparently left in Rome. Everyone else is gone to, to have uh, lunch uh, in a trattoria or to the beach, etc. Now, interestingly, this is not the actor playing Roberto. This is not Jean-Louis Trintignan, the actor that, the French actor that played the part of Roberto. They started shooting and the first day he wasn't there, they kept this nonetheless. And, and then the, the second day he was on the set and they continued. Already you see, notice two things, that the character is kind of shy, not even really leaning out of the window. And therefore you find the introduction here visually of what is in fact, in my view, more of a theme more, more central of a theme than new versus old, modernity raping old societies, the theme of distance or integration, distance or closeness, where the character, the young Roberto, is very much representative of this detachment from reality, this inability to immerse into reality and act into it, bring action into it. And the other character, Bruno, is quite the opposite. It's the quintessential Italian. You know these Italians all touchy-feely, right? That they have to touch you when they talk, that they have to get closer, that they are close talker and loud talker, that, that you feel intruded by them. Or, intruded in different ways, right? Because traditionally, and this is true to a degree even today, you go to Italy as a tourist, you barely exchange a few words with someone at the bar, they invite you home, right? They create this closeness. They invite you to the marriage of their daughter, to the christening of their nephew, right? This is the traditional Italian custom and Italian identity. So in some ways, Bruno is really a typical Italian which breaks the logic of the potential interpretation of modernity because modernity comes from outside, right? It's industrialization, it's the entertainment industry, etc. And uh, uh, 
tradi versus traditions. So you see him distant. Right? And you have this scene from a distance that has to develop the connection. So Bruno sees Roberto, finally there is someone, and he asks if Roberto can make a phone call for, for him, right? You see he, here, do me a favor, right? And again, now you see that it is a different actor. Jean-Louis Trintignant uh, has acted in a number of movies. He died only a few years ago, maybe 2019. He was very old when he died. We will find him also in the next film, A Man and a Woman from 1966. He was very popular, he became very popular at that time, and he acted in Italian and French movies, a few American movies later as well. Okay, so you see that he does represent a certain kind of innocence, right? The way he dresses, the way he behaves, the way he reacts, but it's not animal-esque, it's not moving like Bruno, who's instead is, is very corporeal in his, uh, in the way he approaches life. So, Bruno needs to make a phone call, and he says, uh, dial this number, uh, 13, 26, 62, 4. Okay, check, it is the number. Uh, and, uh, and he says yes, of course, because he's not used to these kinds of intrusion, but he cannot find a way to respond in any other way. So he finds himself enmeshed, right? Which is, again, it, it, it's th th this typical Italian stickiness, right? So he goes, he, he complies because he's kind of submissive. He complies. And he doesn't know what to do. So he has to call someone to say that, that Bruno is on his way to meet this group. But he doesn't know Bruno's name, right? So what is it to do? And in terms of this contrast, the loss of innocence, uh, modernity bringing chaos, notice the mise-en-scene. Notice the set that represents, portrays, this character, right? Books, shelves, everything is clean, everything is very organized. He's a student, he's studying jurisprudence, so we know that he's very reliable, very responsible, even on the day when every single person has left Rome, he's there to study law, right? To prepare an exam. He has an exam in September, right? Italian universities work differently. Okay, so you see him in this kind of environment, which is the opposite of what the other character stands for. So he doesn't know what to do, really. Even a simple phone call is too much for him. So he says, come up. And the moment he says, come up, that's when he has, inv has invited everything that is the opposite into his life, and his life will never be the same from this moment on. At this point, you have a connection that will not be broken and uh, cannot be broken for obvious reasons by the end of the film, as you will see. So Bruno goes up, runs up, of course, Bruno is always like that, He's always running, moving, very physical, and Bruno is Vittorio Gassman, a famous Italian film, uh, film, uh, film and theater actor from the period he got an Italian, something like an Italian Oscar for the interpretation of the uh, character, and typical of Roberto. Roberto not only is not engaged with reality, keeping distance, but always regretting, always thinking and second thinking, second guessing, so says, maybe I should have called. I don't even know who it is. Now he's saying, if I had called, this guy would not be coming into my apartment. But it's too late. And again, appearance of order. They introduce each other. And you can see the body, different body language. 
distance represented by Roberto, and there is a certain chaotic uh, uh, panache about, about Bruno. You see the, the shirt is open, you see the tension in his neck, uh, you see the, the, the posture that, that is engaging, it's not, it's all about closeness. And not only he comes into the physical world of Roberto to make this phone call, and of course he will not be able to find these friends, these friends have left themselves, but he comes into Roberto's life. Because right away, while he's doing the phone call, he says, what's this? Civil procedure. And says, oh, good doorstop material. So right away is being dismissive of everything that Roberto, the young guy, thinks important, right? Saying, well, what is this? In fact, later on, Bruno will suggest, well, what are you studying law for? Maybe you should study space law, right? Uh, this is the age of space exploration. So modernity is uh, uh, associated with space travel. So you should study space law. So he is critical in a very rough way, right, of law. Again, he doesn't know Roberto, so you see the closeness is represented by this line as well, right? Who are you? You're a stranger to me. Not only you're in my house, but you're invading my privacy, looking at my stuff, and then being critical of what I do. But we don't even know each other. So intruding is one of the ways that closeness manifests itself in the character of Bruno. It's always invading other people, other people's lives. And sometimes he can do so cruelly or even in a way that feels cringy. Yet, you, you cannot completely criticize him because he's a more complex character. Then he looks at a picture and he says, who's the party? Who's this fat woman? And of course it is Roberto's mother. So you see that is crass, that is violent, that is invasive, intrusive, yet Roberto can't find a way to react. Because again, Bruno is all about this. For one thing, Bruno is always moving, always changing. So there is no time for someone like Roberto, who's very reflective, very introverted. There is no time to strategize, to think of a reaction, to think of a behavior that would be appropriate. And also, he cannot react because there is something about Bruno. You know that Bruno is negative. You know that Bruno is the sum of a long list of negative reactions, but there is something also sad and pathetic. In, in some ways, Bruno is the quintessential Italian and represents the Italian mindset that emerged from the Counter-Reformation period, right? When uh, the rest of Europe went into Protestantism and Protestantism became the foundation for capitalism and for Western societies, right? Responsibility, values, integrity. And the Italian Catholic response to this was, you have to be good, you have to behave, but if you don't, you can repent, you can be forgiven. So it's a mix of trying, 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 or even being sincere, but also being hypocritical. If you cannot succeed, make excuses or pretend that you're getting there, right? So this is what makes it difficult both for the characters in the story and the viewers to be destroying Bruno because Bruno is so negative, almost to a criminal point. Yet there is something about him that wants to be forgiven, wants to be loved. And there is something weak about him because if he were stronger, you would say, oh, it's an asshole. You would just say that but there is something soft in him as well. Okay, so he's ruined law, he's ruined his mother, 
now is physically attacking the apartment. He goes to the bathroom because, of course, he's very intrusive, so he has to go to the bathroom to clean up. He's sweaty, so he wants to uh, wash up, wash up. And uh, Roberto is thinking, not acting, just thinking, I should tell him about the chef in the bathroom because it's not steady. And of course, you hear the shelf going down, everything being broken, and Bruno just saying, oh, okay, what is this? Not even really, truly apologizing, right? So you know that Bruno is a destructive force in his life, yet with all this thinking and double thinking, Roberto cannot find a way to react to it. And he comes out and he's half naked, which is, of course, you have to put it in the context of Italian society in the 1962. And so this too is assuming that there is a kind of intimacy that doesn't exist, right? Why would a stranger appear with his torso completely naked in front of Roberto, right? Yet for Bruno, this is normal. Right? He's gone from 0 to 100 in terms of connection and intimacy. And of course, the nakedness and, and the representation of the body of Bruno, Gassman was very muscular at the time, is also a way to uh, articulate the theme of masculinity, which is one of the themes of the story. And, and Bruno, if you notice the line, was criticizing Roberto. What, what is this? The shelf was, was put there with spit in, instead of nails or, or glue. So it's not his fault if he ruined the bathroom. In terms of, in reference to the theme of distance, you find Roberto and Bruno talking about people from the other side of the building. There is an apartment where Valeria lives. And Valeria is the young woman that Roberto is in love with, but from a distance. In fact, they only spoke once at the university, and they saw each other in the streets another time, but mostly he is expressing his desire from a distance. So his distance, his excessive closeness. His a faulty distance, a distance that you would want to push him to limit, right? And his closeness to the point of intrusion, you would want to push him away. So you want to push Roberto into the action, and you want to push Bruno out because he's too close to you. And notice the closeness, right, even physically, how he's leaning into Roberto, right, from in, in this shot. So Bruno leaves the apartment, and right after he leaves, he comes back, he knocks or rings the bell, and he says, you're going to stay all inside all day studying, and he invites, since Roberto is the only person he has found, he invites, Bruno invites Roberto to spend the day with him, to have lunch with him. And again, again notice the posture of Roberto, notice how Bruno leans into him and, and the closeness, right, the invasion of Roberto's space. And not only that, but Bruno takes charge. Bruno takes charge of the situation. And this is Roberto trying to get back inside because he was literally pushed out of the apartment. And now he realizes that he doesn't have his keys with him. And Bruno says, no, no, I took the keys. I saw them on a hook by the door. I took the keys. And from this mo moment on, Roberto is essentially hostage to Bruno. So in, in a very interesting way, The Hitchhiker, 1953, and Il Surpasso, 1962, which seem to be completely opposite films, are very close to one another. Because you will find two characters spending a lot of time in a car or near a car, and one psychologically the hostage of the other. Because Roberto will never be free, really. We'll always have Bruno by him telling him what to do or influencing him 
psychologically. However, at the end of The Hitchhiker, Jill and Roy are free to go, even though they're broken men in some ways, right? You don't have a big scene of relief. They're not restored to their former selves. At the end of this film, Roberto will die in an accident caused by the driving, the fast driving of Bruno. Okay, so keep this in mind. It's a comedy, it's an Italian comedy from this period. Italian comedy is very, very popular and worldwide, but it has this kind of dark side to it. The final death, the scene of the accident, which is kind of gruesome also, and this kind of intensity, whereby Bruno is always there, always pressing on Roberto. And, and you sometimes feel for Roberto, you would like Roberto to get out of that situation. But it cannot. Okay, so they are together in the car. They go through the center of Rome, and you see Bruno in action. You see that Bruno is careless in driving, doesn't have any respect for rules. In here, he's going through a one-way street and speeding, and you have the Italian traffic police trying to stop him, but he, he just continues on. So you see how the driving represents Bruno's approach to life. They get to this trattoria for this Ferragosto lunch, but the trattoria is closed. Because even the people at the trattoria want to enjoy Ferragosto, want to enjoy this typical holiday. And so Bruno says, don't worry, there is another place. It's not too far. Roberto says, yes, it is too far. No, no, because the car is fast. Notice that the car itself is symbolic of Bruno, right? It's a fast car uh, and has one shiny side, but another side where you can see that paint is missing. So it's kind of broken also, was not repaired. And this is a representative indicative of Bruno's life, which is not well put together or well maintained. It was a, a genius intuition to keep the car. They, they got this car from a garage the producers, the director, and they decided, let's leave it like that. Let's start shooting with the car as it is. Let's not fix the paint. And, and it's really a brilliant way to represent Bruno's life. They finally get, they drive around a lot. They finally get to Civitavecchia, which is a, a port, major port near Rome. This is where the ships going to Sardinia, for example, leave from, and um, they, have lunch in this trattoria. They have a fish soup. Uh, the place is about 50 miles from home. Okay, so they've already left whatever is the familiar environment of Roberto, and Roberto will, will never go back to Rome, in fact, right? So they finally have this fish soup. Guess what? Roberto doesn't like a fish soup. But it's Bruno ordering for him. And Roberto cannot say anything, doesn't say anything. And look that Roberto is kind of angry, at least with frowning in anger, and does this a lot, but never finds a way to take charge again. He's psychologically hostage to Bruno, because Bruno is so intense. So after the lunch, Bruno goes, takes a room, because the trattoria is also a pensione, they have bedrooms, so very typical Italian style says, oh, take a room and go for a siesta, right, to, to rest. But in fact, it's not even that. He has a plan, Bruno. He will call in to have a bottle of water delivered to his room because he wants to have sex with the young waitress of the place, and... Uh, um, while this is allegedly happening, because in fact we'll know that the, the waitress will refuse to have sex with Bruno, Roberto tries to catch a bus. Not to go back to Rome, but to go back, to go to find and visit his relatives near Grosseto. So he's trying to go farther north into Tuscany. But 
even there, he will be grabbed by Bruno. Bruno finds him, takes him away, takes him back to the car and says, okay, you want to go see these relatives? I'll take you there, right? And he's called in, right? You see that Roberto is hostage to Bruno. So they go visit these relatives who live in this kind of castle, this palace in the countryside near Grosseto in southern Tuscany. So this is part of the representation of old versus new, right? This is the opposite of modern life. After they've spent a few hours with uh, Roberto's relatives, they drive out and they were supposed to go to back to Rome at this point, but as you see, it's dark. As the uh, sign says, there is, Roma is 252 kilometers away, 150 miles away. And instead, this sea resort, this famous place on the shores of Tuscany, Castiglioncello, is only 20 miles away. So at this point, Bruno, it's easy for Bruno to say, come on, we're so much closer to this nice place, Castiglioncello, let's go there, let's have another fish soup. And again, Roberto doesn't like fish soup, but Bruno will decide. They go to this nightclub, which is an expensive place, but Bruno doesn't have that kind of money and is constantly borrowing money from Roberto. Roberto is richer, Roberto comes out of, of the house, he says at some point that he had 35,000 liras in his pockets and 35,000 liras at that point in 1962 were like half the monthly wage of a, a, a worker, lower middle class worker. So he has a little bit of money. He's studying in Rome, but then the apartment is not his family. He is renting the apartment. His family is living in another town and he leaves, goes to university, but he has a whole apartment to himself. So it's kind of so they go, they're supposed to go and have dinner in this place, this fancy place. However, uh, Bruno meets there someone who gave Bruno money to go to Calabria, like 600 miles south of there, to do some work. And he says, what are you doing here? What the hell are you doing here? You were supposed to be in Calabria. And so Bruno has to patch up things with this businessman. And at that point, Roberto says, okay, if you have this, you're going out to dinner with this businessman, I'll go back to Rome, I'll go to the train station. And this is the only time that Bruno really takes off by himself, but it's a failed attempt. He goes to the station, they tell him the next train to Rome is 5 or 7 in the morning, and, and this is 10 o'clock at night, or yeah, 10, 25 at night. So... It's a no-go for him, no freedom. And there he sees a woman and he thinks it is Valeria because he knows that Valeria went to Viareggio, which is farther north in Tuscany, on the shores of Tuscany, so maybe it is Valeria. It is not, of course, Valeria. But at least for the first time, he's getting closer to a woman and does so by acting like Bruno for a little bit, right? So this woman is there by herself because her fiancé was supposed to get there by train, but he didn't get there. And notice that for the first time, he's breaking the distance, right? He's leaning into her. He's physically closer to her, to, to her. So you see that there is a transformation that Roberto is turning into Bruno a little bit. But he doesn't succeed. The woman will leave. So. The woman leaves, the train is the next morning, he goes back to the nightclub by himself. Bruno is at the table with other people and he's there. And you see how he's not integrated in the space. You see how he's lost, even in here, unable to connect, right? But he's back there, closer to Bruno. And Bruno gets into a fight with people that he passed with his car. Il sorpasso means the overtake, right? And he gets into a fight with these people who were driving a small Fiat 600. Uh, so it's kind of uh, 
uh, a class warfare as well. And for the second time, Roberto behaves differently. He gets into the fight. He tries to uh, help Bruno. And to solidify this idea that Roberto is transforming, then you see Roberto driving the car. He's never driven a car, and now Bruno is teaching him how to drive to the point where Robert, Bruno has to say, slow down to Roberto. He's driving fast. He's turning into Bruno. He's drinking. And they go see. They leave the nightclub where they don't really have dinner. And they go find nearby, there is a small villa where Bruno's wife lives. Bruno has left his wife, he's separated from her. Keep in mind, there is no divorce in 1962 in Italy. Divorce will come in 1974 in Italian society. But they're estranged, they're separated, which is also illegal because uh, before divorce, uh, there was a specific law that prevented any one of the spouses from leaving permanently the house. Uh, you can live temporarily for work, etc., but not live uh, and, and never go back. That was against the law. You could be arrested for that. And in fact, there was a famous uh, case involving a celebrity and athlete, Fausto Coppi, who uh, uh, had an affair with a woman, and his wife did, reported him to the police for leaving the house, for abandoning uh, the marital uh, place, okay? So they go see his wife. Of course, things don't go well in there. There, we also come to see uh, Bruno's daughter, who's very young, but she uh, has a relationship with a much older man, even older than Bruno, who has a lot of money and a very fast car, a fast Jaguar. Okay, and you see Roberto is kind of engaged. He's fitting in in some ways. He's observing and trying to understand for the first time, showing a little more understanding of reality. They leave the house after a failed attempt by Bruno to have sex with his wife. They leave the house and they go spend the night on the beach, which happened a lot in Italy in the 1960s and 70s. People without money would spend the time, the night at the beach. Don't do it, it's humid, uh, not comfortable. And of course, at this point you can, it's easier to get arrested than it was then. They wake up the next morning and the beach is full of people, it's crowded. People are on vacation in this resort in Tuscany. The typical setup of Tuscany, right? you have these small cabins where you keep your stuff, you change into a swimsuit, and then you rent the umbrellas, etc. So there they are in, in this chaotic situation. They spend a little time at the beach. This is the next day, right? They left Rome. This is August 16. They left Rome in the morning, no, the afternoon, early afternoon of uh, August 15. This is the morning of August 16. And after spending a few hours at the beach, they decide to take the road again. And this time, they're both coordinating their efforts. They're, they want to drive to Viareggio so that Roberto can see Valeria, talk to her. Because Valeria is with her family vacationing farther north on the shores of Tuscany. So here we are again. They take the road with their fast car. And this time... It is Roberto inciting Bruno to go faster. The transformation seems to be complete. Roberto was so shy, so distant. Now you see how close they are. And it is Roberto himself saying, faster, faster, pass the car. And of course, this pass will be uh, lethal. Eventually, they're uh, fighting with another car. Uh, a sports uh, Fiat. This is a Lancia. This is a... Fiat and on, on this uh, road on the, on the shores and the other car is trying to block them and at some point there is a truck coming the other way and in order to avoid the truck Bruno has to go sideways 
he hits uh, one of the road posts and he's thrown out of the car, but the car with Roberto ends up uh, down the cliff. And of course, Roberto is dead. And there, and there are a few people. And this is the end of the film. You don't even see Roberto. Roberto is, is no more. Okay? So the story seems to be simple. A guy who's very different who drags the younger character into a sort of adventurous road trip, which will turn to be lethal for him. But again, it is not just about modernity, because Bruno is associated with a lot of the accessories and practices of modernity versus older Italian values and loss of innocence. As I said, it's about being detached from reality or being at the center of reality like Bruno is trying to do, but ultimately, is Bruno really able to integrate into reality better than Roberto? Not really. The only person he connects with is Roberto himself, and he kills him in a way. Okay? But keep in mind this aspect. Think of the hitchhiker. Think of this connection. Think of how Roberto is psychologically captive to Bruno to the point where he starts acting like him, but it's not like him. And, and this is, these are the consequences. Now, in reference to uh, the themes, what's interesting is that they're driving, driving everywhere, never stop. But what is the motivation of their drive? The real motivation is frustration. This movie is nothing but a long series of disappointments that push the characters to try something else, to drive another place. But constantly, both Bruno and Roberto, especially Bruno, are being frustrated in their efforts. So the idea is that modern life is about speed, changing constantly, but the motor, what is the engine of, of that constant instability is frustration, is the inability to find satisfaction, right? So at the very beginning of the film, Bruno is not able to find a phone. He's trying to get a public phone from inside a store, right? Because you have this kind of closure, so he puts a hand in there but cannot get the kind of push the coins inside the phone. You see the sign, this is the sign that it, it's an erratic. In some old places, you can still find this sign which indicate a public phone is available there. And Bruno is frustrated in his attempt to find people in Rome to spend the day, right? He calls them, it's too late, they don't answer, they have left already and we know that he's driven all the way from Amalfi for this so big frustration big disappointment Robert, Roberto himself is kind of frustrated right he's in love with this woman but never makes a true attempt to connect in fact the frustration is represented by the fact that he says oh there is someone, maybe it's Valeria, maybe Valeria is there, we'll connect. No, it's an old woman who is there to water the plants. So, frustration again. Frustrated desire. The car itself is frustrating Bruno. They go to the first trattoria, and they're frustrating in their attempt to find lunch there. And they go and go and go, and the only place where they're happy is the car is driving fast, because at least there, there is the anticipation of something that never comes. But it's the only time we see them happy, or at least one of them happy. They go to this other place, and notice that the instability that Bruno would say, the foot's great here, and then he's talking about letting go 
of, of two German women, young women they saw on the road and maybe they wanted to pursue them. And notice in terms of modernity, old versus new, that you have this open air trattoria, people uh, doing music and a car driving through it, right? So it's the old being invaded by the new. But right after that, they decide, look, the foot stinks here. Donkey hoofs and fig wine. So they leave. Complete instability and complete frustration because they haven't had lunch uh, yet. They go pursue those women. They manage to find the two German women, but they go to this place and realize that the women are in a cemetery. 1962, 17 years after the war, you, you did find Germans coming to see their relatives, the tombs of their relatives in uh, uh, war cemeteries. Italy is still full of war cemeteries. So these are the two German women. They decide, no, it's, a no, it's not a go. Uh, let's go away. It's not a, we cannot approach them since they may be here for their, their family, the dead of their family. But in this effort to show their frustration, we know that instead the German women are just there because they're curious and they would have gone out for lunch with them. They say, questi italiani sono strani, these Italians are strange, meaning they followed us all the way here and now they leave. They don't even try. They go to a gas station and Bruno is trying to get cigarettes, cannot get cigarettes, the machine is not working. Frustration after frustration. Small thing, big, big things, but it's always frustration is the pattern, the narrative pattern. He's trying to approach the cashier, and of course, doesn't go anywhere. Frustration. Roberto uh, likes the waitress in this place, the Trattoria in Civitavecchia, where they have the fish soup, and clearly she likes him. There is something, but nothing, nothing happens. So once again, frustration. You see, now this is a key moment, she's fetching water, and he knows that Bruno's plan is to have her deliver the water and then clearly jump on her, right? Because Bruno is like that. It's, it's not really that refined of a, a, a lover, but he's not able to tell her, don't go. He's not able to say, stay with me, because there is a moment when she looks at him. We see first the water, and we know what the water means. It means she's about to have sex with Bruno. He thinks that Bruno will overtake her, even though this will not happen. And they look at each other, and, and he's angry. He's angry because... Bruno will have sex with him, with her, and he's angry because he's not able to stop the woman. And she looks at him with some empathy, with some, there is a connection, but he cannot act on it. And he decides to leave. He cannot leave, he's grabbed by Bruno. So everything is being frustrated. Everything ends with the opposite result. Then Bruno will say him, that him, he himself was frustrated that he couldn't uh, seduce the waitress. At the train station, where uh, uh, Roberto sees a woman that looks like Valeria, he's trying to connect with her and managing to connect with her, but then she leaves. Someone comes by with a car, and they call her, and she leaves, right? Another frustration is left alone. Inside the nightclub, Bruno is dancing with the wife of the businessman who was disappointed with him because he was not in Calabria, and they really connect. She's really drawn to him. This time, there is a real opportunity for sex. Clearly, she wants to have sex with him, but it won't happen. Again, everything is being... Uh, every attempt at reaching a goal is frustrated, which prompts the decision to go somewhere else, go somewhere else, go somewhere else. And look at this. Now, Bruno, uh, Roberto is sitting by himself at another table in this nightclub, and he will connect 
she will look at him in insistently. She wants to connect, but again, it doesn't happen. And this is also the theme of distance, right? She's looking at him, she's there with a rich man who's much older than she is, and when they might connect and do something, the guys who will start a fight with Bruno appear and say, there he is, let's go beat him up. Because Bruno caused an, almost caused an accident, almost caused them to hit a wall, and the businessman is leaving. So even the business deal ends up with nothing. And here I will stop. Thank you for your patience. I will continue on Wednesday. Let me know if you need anything.